And we're back. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Power Is Now Homeownership Series 2023. This is our third year conducting this series on homeownership, learning about the experience of others who've gone through the process. So perhaps you're looking to buy your first home, you've been pre-approved and you're having difficulty finding property, uh, you're getting outbidded, or you're just going through the struggle. I want to encourage you to hang in there because mm -hmm. if you can get in, you're going to win. And every single uh, interview that we're having uh, is a winning scenario of them having the courage to start the process, getting into homeownership and holding on, uh, allowing it to take them to where they are today, uh, far more uh, successful uh, in terms of uh, uh, economics than they would have been had they chose to rent all this time. With me today is Donnell Spivey, and he is the broker owner of Essex Spivey Realty Pros in Elcott, Maryland. He's with us today to talk about his homeownership journey. And uh, Donnell, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join me and to talk about this very important topic. The homeownership rate, as you know, uh, leading the National Association of Real Estate yeah. Brokers uh, is the lowest. We have the lowest rate of homeownership of yeah. any ethnic group. And yeah. um, that's a problem for us in so many ways, right? It's a problem for me as well. You know, and, and we look at the uh, crime rate across the city, uh, any major city for that matter. And it's us that are committing a lot of the crime. And I think a lot of it starts from home. I mean, own a home because mm -hmm. they don't feel like they own anything, so they mm -hmm. don't have a problem with destroying it. So, wow, wow, it's a big challenge here in uh, the Baltimore area as well, uh, and we've got to do something to correct that. Yeah, when you own a home, there's pride of ownership, right? Mm -hmm. And you're establishing roots in your community. You have a voice, and you and you do take care of things that you invest in, right? Right. <laughs> You feel like you're a part of the community when you own a piece of it. But if you don't own it, then you what have I got to lose? Now, were your parents homeowners? Yes. Okay. So, so you knew what it you knew what that felt like and looked like as a child growing up, right? That that they uh I mean, were they homeowners when you were born or did they buy a home later on in life and you kind of were aware of what they were going through? So no, my parents were sharecroppers. Uh, they did not own a home initially. When I was a little boy, I can never, I'll never forget the first house that they brought. I was helping the contractor remove the um, stumps from the wooded area where the house was built. And that house is still in our family today. Wow. How many years is that now? So that's 60 some years it's still in That's the house amazing. in the family my sister moved back from uh new york the house was vacant for a while and of course we went would go there and visit but no one was living there permanently so she recently well not recently about 11 years ago she moved from new uh, from new york back to the home house where she still stays Wow, that's an amazing story. And so I, I'm certain that everyone cherishes cherishes this, that property uh, yes. because it's been in the family so long. It's a it's it's history. It's five years. There's a lot of roots in that family, in that house. A lot of them. And so uh, when ahead. you left home, when you left home, uh, you you went to college. Uh, tell us about your education, your background. So you grew up at home uh, with homeowners and you went out on your own and uh, went to school, got married. Give us that background. So I did not go to college. I left North Carolina out of high school and started my career without going to college uh, and have never gone to college before. Uh, so it tells your listening audience that college is great. I probably would have done better had I gone to college, but it wasn't necessary for me. I had another drive. And the other drive was just to be successful at what I did. Uh, when did you get married? 
So I got married. Uh, I've been married for 30 years now, two wives, but 30 years. <laughs> so I got married when I was uh, 23, the first time, and got divorced, and I remarried five years ago. So marriage is uh, a very big part of your life, and uh, you have kids, right, as well. Yes. Um, at what point uh, did you, were you married when you bought your first home, or did you buy a home and then you got married? So that's a very good. I'm glad you brought that out because my my parents were married 62 years. Uh, so I brought my first house with my wife. We actually went to closing on a Friday. My son was born on Sunday. Oh, <laughs> and, and that was 1976. Wow. So how interesting, you grew up in a home where your parents owned their home. Uh, and so you made sure that your son from day one would grow up in a home that you own. And never lived in an apartment. Wow. That's, that's something, unfortunately, that many African-Americans cannot say. Yeah. I lived in an apartment, but he never did. Right. So what was the catalyst? You said earlier that you and your brother, uh, I mean, whose idea was it was to pull your resources together, use his uh, GI Bill, the VA loan, to buy a home? Whose idea was it? It was my idea, so I tell the story. I had the idea. My other younger brother had the money, and my older brother had the GI Bill. Okay. <laughs> So you're exactly right. We pulled our resources to get that first home. Now, Daniel, why is it we don't see more of that type of cooperation mm -hmm. uh, in African American communities? Because that that your story is a very common story in Latino communities mm -hmm. and Asian communities, but it's not very common in African American communities. Can you speak to why that is? Well, I think it has to do with the upbringing. A lot of the things that are happening within the African American, especially, it starts at home. And it starts from, you know, parents teaching um, religious beliefs and believing in family. It's all about families. And everything that I do is family related, NARAB family, uh, exit family. Uh, you know, it, it, it's all about family. And when you have that mindset, then you can do other things that you, other don't believe in. So one of the things that have helped me excel me where I'm at today is family, because I took risks that most people wouldn't take, because I could rely, if I got in trouble, I could rely on my family as a support. I really could. Wow. Yeah, that's very important. You know, uh, prior to slavery, you know, uh, both the slave owner and the slaves, uh, their wealth was in their children, right? Mm -hmm. The ability to have a large family enabled you to be able to work the farm and to, you know, produce more uh, because of the help and the labor. Uh, family is wealth. My parents had 13 kids. That's amazing. You do not hear that. 13 kids. Where do you fit in that number? I'm 10. I'm the 10. I tell everybody I'm the 10. <laughs> I'm the 10th child. The 10th. You're the 10th, right? Yeah, I'm the 10th. I tell oh, them I'm the, I, I'm the 10. <laughs> wow. Wow. Man, I can't even imagine you know, what it would take to feed 13 kids and to manage 13 kids and to house 13 kids. And um, what, what you are your have, ages? You, you hit on it. The kids has helped build wealth because they could work. Uh, we grew up on a farm mm. and they could work the farm. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So you you leave this uh, this city the city of children and brothers and sisters <laughs> house, and you strike out on your own uh, right out of high school. Uh, I assumed you rented an apartment. How long did you rent before 
you bought your first home? So uh, I had two brothers that was living in Maryland when I graduated from high school. And one of the brothers came to, Mer to uh, home to North Carolina to visit. And he simply asked, would you like to go back to Maryland with me? Within a weekend and I was gone. I went to uh, Maryland, lived with two brothers, one brother, which was married at the time. Uh, and we lived in the same apartment until the younger brother and I moved out into a, a, a separate apartment. And we went after to a third apartment when another brother came up from North Carolina and that's when the three of us got together to buy this house. Wow. I tell you the, the power of family. Now, you, were, <laughs> you, were, you were paying rent. What was your rent at the time? I don't even remember. Uh, it was cheap. I remember the first house. I, we, we talked about the house that I brought when I got married. And my son was born two days after we brought the house. The monthly payment on that house was like 400 bucks. Oh, my goodness. And you, was, was your rent cheaper than that? Was your rent cheaper than that or about the same? Rent was probably a little bit cheaper because my wife at the time, she was afraid to tell her mother how much we were paying <laughs> in a mortgage payment. <laughs> because it was, I mean, it wasn't like we brought the cheapest house in the area, but we brought right. the house that was comfortable for us in the location. Right, yeah. right. Wow. So it, how did it feel to make that transition from renting to buying? Uh, and was it a step up? I mean, like, could you afford it? Were you afraid? Or was everybody pitching in to make that $400 payment? No. Uh, so the first house the three of us brought together was $16,900. It was a townhouse uh, actually near Morgan State College. And then so uh, we left from there when I got married and brought a detached home. So that's why there was a difference in terms of value of rent versus the mortgage. The mortgage was in a different neighborhood, if you will, mm. and it's a detached home. Uh, it was a good fit for us. So uh, how long was it after you, you went from the condo to the de detached single family home? So we brought the single family home in 73. Mm -hmm. And we brought the uh, detached home in 76. So it was three years. And was it a step up in mortgage payment and, and price yes. at that time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, yeah, do you first, recall what it was? I don't recall the numbers, but the... The first house was only 16900 that the bro my brothers and I brought together. But the detached house, I think it was around $40,000 at the okay. time. Okay. Yeah. Now, how long did you hold on to that home before you sold it? Or do you still have that home today? I don't. Uh, so we moved there in 76, and we sold it in, two, in 90. Oh, wow. So you had it for a while. Yes. Do you remember what you sold it for? Because you had to experience some serious appreciation holding on to it that long. Um, I don't remember the sales price of it when I sold it, but uh, I was a real estate agent at the time, so I sold it myself. Okay. Uh, but I don't remember the actual number. And it's amazing that uh, we moved to a, a brand new home and at that time, this was in 1990, that home, the new home was 250000 And now that home, I don't live in it anymore. Now that home is uh, probably about 900000 Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So let me get it right here. So 16000 to 40000 to a price unknown that you sold it for, you can't recall, uh, to uh, a two hundred thousand dollar home after that, two fifty, two two fifty. So you kept moving up, and mm -hmm. can I say that with each step, uh, you were able to use the profit, the equity, to move up into a much better home each time you did this. Absolutely, absolutely. And so that last home you purchased at two hundred thousand is worth 900,000 today. And you bought that home in, when? When did you buy that $200,000 home? $250,000 home was brought in 1990. 
1990, and here we are, 2023, and that home is worth 900000 today. So at tell least. me, where are you? What's that? At least. At least, at least. Yeah. And so where are you now today? The, 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 the home you live in now would be your most recent purchase in terms of primary residence. Mm -hmm. And what did you pay for that? And, and where is that at in terms of equity appreciation today? It's right around the corner from the $900,000 house because my wife and I got divorced and I wanted to keep the kids in the same school area. So I brought a house right walking distance around the corner. And uh, that's where I re reside at currently. And that home at the time, that was, uh, what year was that? That must've been 2003. So that home at that time was 400, 420, 420. Okay. And and what is it worth today, Mr. Realtor? <laughs> <laughs> it's about 900. 900,000. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So clearly real estate has been very good to you and helping you build wealth. Let me yes. ask you, Donnell, did you have any money when you got started? I mean, obviously you used the VA loan, you collaborated with your brothers and sisters, you guys pulled your resources together. Uh, and so at what point did uh, you start to really feel the power, the economic power that you were building in terms of equity and cash. And then did you acquire other properties that you didn't live in along mm -hmm. the way? That's when I started realizing the importance of homeownership and real estate. Well, it wasn't the per first purchase. The first purchase, purchase was just to get out of the townhome and buy and become a homeowner. But when we started investing, is where I started understanding the importance of home ownership or of investing in real estate. So, Danielle, tell me about your investment experience. At what point did you start buying other property outside of the property that you lived in? And what were some of the, the challenges and, and barriers that you had to overcome uh, to start you know, buying more property? So, remember, it's, it's all about family. So, after we brought that first house, we, uh, two of my brothers, we went together and buy, brought investment properties. And then eventually uh, they broke off and brought individual investment properties for themselves. And so did I. So we went from uh, 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 another townhouse that was right around the corner from the first house. And we brought that together. And then it, each one of the brothers uh, branched out and brought own individual properties that they rent out or that we rented out. And that's, that's where we actually got started at in terms of investing in real estate. So what was your goal? Uh, to have the rental income, you know, replace your income from your jobs or other, other things, uh, you know, wherever your primary uh, income is coming from. In your case, as a real estate agent, I mean, we know in real estate, you know, it's, it can be feast or famine, right? Uh, so right. How, how did you see, what was your strategy in acquiring real estate? I, I don't know that we really had a plan, to be honest with you. It was just uh, the right thing to do and saw the importance of being able to own property and someone else pays for the mortgage. I think that was the mission. It wasn't so much that we had an actual plan of uh, how many houses we we're going to buy. It was just felt the, like the right thing to do. And, you know, and the other thing that we didn't have was guidance from our uh, parents or from any other sibling because mm -hmm. my parents only brought that one house that mm -hmm. they brought and that was the house they owned when they passed away. So, wow. you know, I, I don't know actually where the... Um, uh, I guess the uh, thought process of buying multiple property ever came from other than just realizing it from the first property that we brought. Looking back on it now, I mean, you know, a seasoned real estate in, uh, investor and, and just a veteran in the business, um, was it luck? <laughs> what was it? Uh, I don't think it was luck. I think the, it was the uh, the Lord telling us what to do. I believe uh, that. Because I did not have that vision initially. 
I did not mm -hmm. have the vision of becoming a real estate agent initially. And that's what I'm saying. I, it, it wasn't that I got it from my parents. It wasn't that I got it from uh, my siblings, all those, some of my older siblings, they did own their own homes, but it, it wasn't like they said, well, you got to buy multiple properties. I, I just don't know where it came from. Well, I, I, I appreciate you saying that it was really the Lord put it on your heart, obviously. Yeah. Uh, to mm -hmm. start uh, doing that. And perhaps that underlying tone, you know, uh, our underlying uh, message and faith is, you know, mm -hmm. building wealth right. uh, that's been stored up for you, right? The wealth of the wicked has been stored up for the righteous. And also leaving a, uh, leaving a legacy, an inheritance for your family. Yes, yes. These are biblical principles, right? Yeah, they are, they are. <laughs> and I, I have to say that that's where it came from because there was no other um, source or input from others that I obtained that uh, desire to own multiple properties. In your efforts to acquire property, did you experience any discrimination? Uh, and were there some things you had to do financially? Like, and have you always kind of maintained good credit? Did you have the credit? Did you have the reserves as you began to move beyond the pool of resources with family to operating completely on your own? Well, yeah, uh, credit is uh, the most important thing. If you've got good credit, then there's a lot of things that you can do that others can't do. Uh, and the... The other part that uh, I think helped excel for me was just to know that I could take a chance if I failed, if I fell behind or whatever, always had families to fall back on. That was another thing that I think helped in terms of making some of the moves that we made. Uh, and there have been many a times that I fell short and I called my brother or something and, and it was a no brainer. They was going to help and reach out and vice versa. So that was all about that family thing. Wow. The underlying theme of this show today, folks, is the power of family. <laughs> Being able to, you know, pull your resources together uh, yeah. and to purchase a home. And, you know, what would be your advice today to, uh, to individuals who have large families? And it doesn't even have to be a large family like 13, like you had, it could be a family of two or three or four people, but how would you uh, advise them to come together? I mean, how does that work? You know, one of the biggest challenges I see in terms of selling real estate and being an agent now is there are a lot of people that currently live in apartments. And a lot of times apartments themselves have large rooms, uh, like a bedroom and stuff like that. And then when you try to get your starter home, it may be a smaller bedroom. And, and so they challenge, they, they, they're challenged with, you know, I can't get all my furniture in there. And you've got to sell them to, this is a stepping stone. This is a stepping stone to get to where you want to be. But you got to first stop paying rent. Hmm. And you have to drive that home to them. And once they get it, they go ahead and buy that initial house and they trade up. You know, I'm, I'm selling houses to people now that brought a house 20 years ago. And now wow. they're trading up or trading down. Mm -hmm. uh, so you got to get in the game. You stop talking about the values going up and you can't afford it. Once you get in the game, you're going to appreciate the fact that the values has gone up. <laughs> so that's the selling point of families pulling their resources together uh, to help one person. And then, you know, they just kind of line it up, right? I mean, okay, we're going to start, like in your case, uh, they started with you. Your other two brothers helped you get into a home utilizing his GI Bill, mm -hmm. right? And my other brother money, because I didn't have very much money. So, so at, at, at what point was it the other brother's turn to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a, a structure here for people who have families, uh, how they should go about doing this and helping each other get in the game. So when the three of us brought houses together, as each one of them got married, they moved on 
and they uh, their share of the interest stayed with the remaining brother that stayed in the house. And so uh, my younger brother moved out and got married first. So we paid him his share out. And then I moved out and got married. So they paid the, my last brother paid me my share out. And that's how we did it. It wasn't like it was a contract or anything. There was no contract. It's family. Yeah, it's family. Right, right. I love that. I want to wrap up this segment with talking about some of the financial uh, realities associated with buying a house. And, you know, you got to get ready. Right, you got to get yeah. yourself in a position to buy a home, and so could you outline for us? Let's say the top five, and I'll, I'll help you number them. The top five money moves. What you would recommend? The best money moves you can make to get yourself in a position to buy a home. What would be, say, number one? Credit. Mm. Good credit. So when you've got credit. There are a lot of things that you can do that others that have bad credit can't do. You can get better financing once you have the better credit. That would All be right. number one. That would be number one. Number two. Start a saving program. Save towards buying a house. Say, uh, you know, you just have to have a separate fund for buying a house and don't touch it until you buy a house. Don't yeah, touch it. An, an account they're only for the house, nothing yes. else. Yes. What would be number three? Number three is uh, try to get with a lender that has special programs that can help you be a down payment assistance or closing costs for that first time home buyer. Because uh, there are tons of them out there. The problem is a lot of the uh, agents, and in some cases, the banks don't even know about the program because everybody don't do those first-time homebuyer programs. Oh, my goodness. I'm so glad you said that. That's number three. And that really ties to number two, because while you're saving money, mm -hmm. you know, I heard one study, mm -hmm. it would take you almost 10 years, maybe 20 years to save enough money for a down payment on a house, putting 20% down. So right. a good lender would have low down payment programs and they would have down payment assistance programs to help you uh, make up the shortfall or perhaps cover all the money, great lending and down payment assistance. What would be number four? Number four was buying in the right location. Oh my goodness. Right location. You know, that hasn't changed, right? Location, <laughs> location, 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 right. So yeah. let's speak to that, buying in the right location. Yes. So, uh, you know, people look at buying based on price. Never buy based on price, buy based on location. And my theory is buy the worst house in the best neighborhood. And 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 the philosophy behind that, because uh, maybe they, you know, you know how buyers are, especially first time home buyers who've been living in luxury apartments or really mm -hmm. nice, spacious apartments. They have this, they have this unrealistic expectation of of what they can buy versus what they can rent, right? And so, right. Uh, the champagne, I call it champagne taste and beer budgets, right? So. Right. Uh, how do you make them make that the, the see that vision for themselves? What is the motivation behind buying something that's small and perhaps not so pretty, uh, the worst property in the best neighborhood? So you know, uh, a lot of you have heard of uh, FHA two hundred three K, and uh, we have to educate the people on that. But there are other programs. There's a conventional program here in Maryland. You probably do this as well where there's only a 3% down payment required and they can add in the cost for renovating that home. I call it buy the ugly house. I, I'm telling buyers, buy the ugly house, use that program to fix it up. And then you come in with immediate equity. I'll tell you a quick story. I sold this uh, young girl, this is her first home. Uh, she lived with her parents at the time the house across the street was owned by a person that passed. And 
they like the neighborhood, they want them to buy it. So she brought this house for $218,000. She put $92,000 into home in terms of renovation. So now she's got 310 in the house. The house around the corner sold for 350. So she immediately hit $40,000 worth of equity. That's what True I'm story. talking about. Buy the ugly house. I Buy know she's ugly. happy. And, and how long ago was this? Because not this only last she's year. last year. Oh my goodness. So she went in at the 310 and had forty thousand dollars in equity day one. And it's a yeah. year now. What do you think that house is worth now? It, it's probably I want to say probably 385. Wow. Wow. Again, there is that whole idea of, you know, attaching your income to an mm -hmm. asset and over time allowing it to grow in value. That's how most people are building wealth, right? They're not saving exactly. themselves to wealth, right? Who's saving? Who, who can make enough money to actually save after the cost of living, inflation and everything to save their way to wealth? Do you know anybody? No, no. And uh, we actually did a uh, video on uh, that house that she brought. It just happened to be my cousin uh, that brought the home. Uh, but you have, you, have to, you have to have people that you trust that can guide you through the process because the average homeowner, especially the millennials, they don't want to go through those challenges. No. But no. it was... Um, my cousin that lived across the street from this house, his daughter actually brought this house and came out with forty thousand dollars worth of equity. Now, now I know you. I know Eric. You've heard of the phrase "buy the house, then the car." Right. Absolutely. I know you've heard of that. Yes, sir. That's that's NARAB's. That's NARAB, uh, right? That's it. NARAB, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, y'all. N A R B. NAREB.com. Check out that organization, the oldest Black real estate trade association in the country. I mean, there may be others that I'm not aware of, but this is the oldest the one. Oldest in the oldest minority country. trade association in America. In the country. That's right. That's right. Buy the house before the car. Right. And uh, so, so often, though, we see young people, as soon as they get out of get their first job or they get out of college and they're making a little bit of money to go spend money on a Benz or a fancy Toyota yeah. or they just, you know, payment 600, 700. I talked to a guy the other day and the payment was $1,500 a month and he doesn't mm -hmm. own a home. So when, when my cousin got that $40,000 working equity, she could have taken that equity and brought a car. Mm -mm. Now, I probably wouldn't have recommended her to do that. I'd tell her, take that equity and buy another house. But she could have done that, right? Yeah. That's a great option as well. Even yes, a better yeah. option. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I do a lot of uh, personal financial coaching. And I tell people, you know, equity is not real until you sell the house. It's not real. It can go up. It can go down. Right. And that's, that just comes with markets, right? All markets go up and go down. Right. Uh, so it's not real. And so, and it's not money you actually saved. It didn't come from your earnings. It didn't come from your investments. It came, you know, it, it's, it's market driven. And so I believe that any market driven monies you have should stay in the market. So you're going to pull that equity out. You need to use it to buy another house, not pay off debt. If you got a bunch of debt, you need to earn more money, get a part-time job, cut back on your spending, do <laughs> stuff like that. To deal with that debt, don't be using equity to pay off debt. Use equity to create more equity. What do you think about that? I think it's great. I, I think it's a great idea. I was only using it in correlation with buy the house and then the car. Yeah, <laughs> right. Absolutely. Buying that car first is going to stop you. Uh, in fact, I would say that's probably the number one. Yeah. Having been in lending for a long time and working with a lot of buyers, Car payments, I think, are, are number one. I used to say it was student loans, but there's ways to work around student loans. But I right. say there's no way to work around a car payment. It is the number one dream killer in my personal experience in helping people being able to qualify to buy a home. Car payments, man. 
Well, I'm glad you, I like that phrase, number one dream killer. <laughs> yeah. Now let's talk about number five, top five, right? Number five, number, best money moves you can make. You know, a lot of That's people, five. a lot of people can't afford to buy the house that they really want or the location that they really want to buy in. And right. partnering up with another family member or someone that you really trust would be a good option as well. So you're correct. That is number five. So I don't know if you know this or not. You know, I have two radio shows that I do on Saturday. In fact, yeah, let's talk about that. And we're going to go to a break because, <laughs> in fact, you need to, I need an invitation, man. Come on, man. You've always had me. an invitation. <laughs> My goodness. I don't know. Oh, you know what? That was years ago. That was years ago. I haven't gotten a recent invitation. But tell everybody where they can listen to you and how often you do your show. So I'm on Praise 106.1 in Baltimore every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. It's an hour show. And then on at 11 o'clock a.m., I'm in on WOLB 1010 a.m. right here in Baltimore. And Eric, you can appreciate this. We are now doing Zoom radio. So we're on the radio and we got people that join us via Zoom so that we can show the houses that we have on the market. That's outstanding. That is outstanding. You are leveraging technology. Absolutely. And new technology. That is Zoom. People can join and see things, see you, talk to you, look at the look at the properties that you have for sale. And old technology, which is terrestrial radio. <laughs> So we're blending the old with the new. How's that? That's right. That's right. You're blending the old with the new. Give us those, give us those call letters again. And what's the telephone number for them to call in too? Because they can do that as well, right? Absolutely. So the uh, call letter is Praise 106.1. And if you want to call in to give a brother a shout out, it's 443-380-2242. That's from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And then at 11 a.m., we start on WOLB, 1010 a.m. And that number is 410-481-1010. Man, I really appreciate you taking time with me today to talk about your experience. And there's so much more to talk about. I want to take us now to overtime uh, and just deal with some really important issues. And that is, you know, uh, leveraging, you know, the uh, living trust uh, when you buy a home and making sure things are taken care of there. That's another big challenge, particularly in the African-American community. Yeah. So can you hang in there for me for just a few more minutes? Yes, I can. All right. We'll be right back, folks. Right after this commercial break, you're listening to or watching The Power Is Now Homeownership Series. 2023 with Donnell Spivey. We'll be right back. Want to keep up with the current developments happening in the world of real estate? The Real Estate Roundtable, hosted by Eric L. Frazier, is a show you do not want to miss. The show features a panel of VIP agents who are passionate about helping people. It is what they do best. They discuss today's hot topics, latest market updates and trends. The panel also conducts interviews with prominent figures in the industry. New episode every Friday live on Facebook and replay on the Power Is Now YouTube channel. 